Yes, sir. We are on live. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shankara Academy of Visions series on 2020 on the happy occasion of World Sight Day. Happy to introduce uh, my friend of almost about 32, 33 years, Yashwant Sauji, who is a great contact lens practitioner. Yashwant is a graduate from Elite School of Optometry and a postgraduate from Bharatiya Vidya Peet Pune. He has uh, a lots and lots of credits to his uh, under his belt, but the most important and the best one that he got was uh, when his practice, Sauji Vision Care, was recognized by David Thom uh, Thomas as a uh, practice of excellence. So Yashwant will be talking about different hats that fit different corneas. So let's uh, listen to Yashwant and please do ask questions as and when you have. Thank you very much. Over to you, Yashwant. Thank you, Aditya. Thank you very much. And wishing you and wishing all the people who are watching this live a very happy World Sight Day. So today we will, uh, it'll be a revision kind of lecture for everyone regarding the fitting of keratoconus lenses, because by now fitting of keratoconus lenses has become pretty common in India and almost every optometrist does it very nicely. So a great morning, let's go through it. And that's my next slide. Yeah. So let's talk about keratoconus options. Initially, you know what happens when we become an optometrist the, the mention of word keratoconus, instantly we say, okay, Roske lenses. So Roske is not the only option for fitting of keratoconic corneas. So let's consider a few other options as well. And uh, first and foremost is our loyal spectacle friend. So sometimes, you know, the early keratoconus patients can benefit just by wearing spectacles. It may have uh, some amount of cylindrical correction, but then the visual recovery is quite good. Then we have the soft hydrogel lenses and most often they need toric soft hydrogel lenses. And you also have specialized designs for fitting keratoconic corneas and soft contact lenses, which is the Kerasoft. Unfortunately, I don't have too much of experience fitting these lenses because I've never fit any, but then you should be familiar with the name Kerasoft. And of course, the most trusted option for correction of keratoconus is the RGP contact lenses. It's not only rose care, I, really, I would like to repeat that. So uh, what are RGP contact lenses? These are slightly different from the regular RGP lenses in a sense that these are steeper in the center, more steeper than the regular RGP contact lenses, and they go rapidly flatter in the periphery because the cone is quite steep in the center. So we need a steeper center than the usual design and a rapid flattening of the periphery. Uh, these could be fit as a small diameter lenses or as large diameter lenses, but most often small dia is preferred. And uh, we should have lenses wherein we have very good control over the edge lift. Because for every patient, the edge lift and the peripheral curves would differ a lot. So uh, definitely we need special designs wherein there is an edge control method employed. So some of the Indian contact lenses which are commonly available, the controlled edge lift designed from pure con contact lenses. Here the edge lift values are, uh, are designated as F values. So you've got F1, F2, F3, F4, F5 like that, you know. You can even order a F1.5. So depending on how flat you want the edge lift, the F value goes on increasing. So your starting point could be F2 lenses. And then if you want more flatter, you go on to F3. If you want more steeper, you go on to F1, that kind of a thing. Uh, they are available mostly as large diameter lenses, but because these are customized lenses, you can order any diameter, whatever you want, right from 8.7 to 10.5, 10.6, 10.8, or even larger. You also have uh, the option of designing your own trial set. If you see the Janet Stone book uh, on contact lenses, Stone and Philip book on contact lenses, it has got ready-made designs of trial sets, although I would not really go into the details of how and why you need to design because ready-made lenses, ready-made trial sets are good enough. Then you have Dr. Chandrasekhar Chavan in India who makes his own contact lenses and calls it as Chandra KC lenses. And there are labs like Contacare and Silk Lens which have got their own designs. So we, we should be aware of what labs are making keratoconus contact lenses in India. Uh, whatever design you use, understanding of that design is very, very important because until and unless you understand the peripheral curves, you really cannot modify them. So when your lab makes a design for you, you should know what is the second curve, what is the first curve, what is the second curve, what is the third curve, and what is the edge lift. 
So once you understand these parameters, it becomes very easy for us to modify the lenses. And we also need to remember the rule of thumb. Like in a base curve, we, we should know that when we make a point, 0 0.05 millimeter change in the curve, the power changes by 0.25 diopter. And we should understand the rules of SAM and FAP, which is steep add minus and flat add plus. So if you're going to steep on the base curve, then you need to add minus to the over refraction. Uh, we can alter the diameter, the base curve, the edge lift to change the fit. These are three parameters generally we play with to change the fitting. And of course, a thorough understanding of fluorescein pattern is must for you to be able to modify the lens fit. Uh, if it is a very difficult case, then I would strongly recommend that you order trial lenses first. These trial lenses are basically PMMA or low decay material contact lenses, so which are available very cheap. Once you're sure about the fitting over refraction and everything, you can duplicate that in better material. So that way, you know, you, you, you uh, get an option of modifying your fit to the best possible. Uh, these lenses, the RGP contact lenses normally exhibit a movement of about one to two millimeters. So uh, we need to remember that we need to assess the fluorescein pattern when the lens is more or less in the center rather than going when the lens is up or when the lens is down. Because when the lens is up or down, it can show a different kind of fluorescein pattern. So make sure you assess the fit when the lens is centered. And if you use a rattan filter, which is a barrier filter, then the fluorescein actually becomes much more prominent and you can understand the patterns much, much better. Uh, the last point here is a bit controversial because many people say that one should not use anesthetic drops. But what I've seen is if you have new patients who have aversion of putting a contact lens or anything on the eye, the anesthetic drops would help to quieten down the patient. But of course, you have to limit it only to your trials and not prescribe them. So the design uh, looks something like this. This is not any particular lab's design but uh, this will basically be enough to give you an idea. You have the optic zone, the base curve, which is the central curve, which aligns the central part of the cornea. Then you've got the peripheral curve one. So the peripheral curve one could be uh, flatter by one diopters and the peripheral curve two could be flatter by two and the peripheral three, uh, third curve would be flatter by about four diopters. So depending on the design, these one, two and four values will go on changing. The edge lift would be a little different. The center thickness would be different. Material, you've got a wide range of material to choose from. So you could just find out uh, what kind of material you want. Very high decay materials and keratoconic corneas may not work because the lens will exhibit flexure. So you have to have a balance of oxygen permeability and stability of the contact lens. And uh, this is a little complicated way of denoting the or uh, ordering the lens from the lab. So a simpler way would be the base curve, the power, the optic zone, the total diameter, the center thickness, material, and the edge lift. So if you give these parameters to the lab, they'll be able to design a lens for you. Then you may have heard of hybrid contact lenses. These were very popular at one time and possibly even today, but not in India as yet. They are made by Synergy Eyes company. I mean, Synergy Eyes is the brand name for those lenses. And <clears throat> sometime back, we had some Indian brand also known as hybrid. I don't know whether it is available today. So basically these are uh, RGP contact lenses having a soft contact lens skirt around them. So they are as comfortable as a soft contact lenses and, and behave as good as the RGP contact lens. So it's, it's uh, the advantage of having both lenses on the eye. Then we, many years back, we used to even attempt fitting piggyback contact lenses and there are so many patients who were so happy with piggyback contact lenses because the touch of the RGP lens to the cornea, not really the uh, touch in exact sense, but the irritation which some people, some sensitive people used to have can be eliminated by putting a cushion between the cornea and the contact lens uh, by inserting a soft contact lens. So first the patient will wear a soft contact lens and then we will put the RGP contact lens. I would not be discussing this in greater detail because these days very rarely this option is chosen because you have excellent minuscleral and scleral contact lenses available for people who are sensitive to corneal lenses. And uh, we of course have the Rose K family of lenses. So in Rose K, you've got Rose K2, Rose K2 nipple cone, Rose K2 post graft and Rose K2 irregular corneas. And plus there are a few more. In minuscleral options, you've got Roski XL. Roski XL is not actually a minuscleral, but a corneoscleral contact lens. You've got Jack Allen, Jupiter, Blanchard Labs, 
Dr. Chavan makes his own design. And there are many others whom I've not mentioned here. And in scleral contact lenses, you've got Boston scleral lenses, you've got the Pro's device and so many others. So now we specifically move on to row scale lenses because I believe these are the most popular lenses which are being fit into in, in the Indian market. And they're quite easy to fit. I would like to acknowledge the support of Dr. Paul Rose in sharing some of his slides and David Thomas Contact Lenses Limited UK. Now the name has changed to Manicon Contact Lenses, but they've been kind enough to provide some of the pictures and slides that have been used in today's presentation. Now, one thing we need to remember is never, never attempt to fit regular RGP contact lenses on a keratoconic cornea because keratoconic cornea is definitely different from a regular cornea and definitely it will need a specialized design of contact lens and not the regular contact lens. So never do that. So we need special design lenses. Uh, now, when we talk about Rose K2, many people wonder what is Rose K2 and why not Rose K1? So Rose K2 is basically Rose K1 with aberration control incorporated. So we've got aspheric curves on the front and the back surface and the abrasion is controlled in these lenses. So although commonly we address it as Rose K, it is the second design of Rose K, which is the Rose K2. Now, if you pay attention to this slide, you will be able to fit Rose K lenses properly. Now we get lost when we put the contact lens on the patient's eye and when we try to see the fluorescein pattern, we don't know where to see. So the best thing is if you assess the fit on these five parameters, and make sure you assess the fit individually on these parameters. Like when you're seeing base curve, only see the base curve. Base curve meaning the central fit of the contact lens. When you see the peripheral fit, only concentrate on the peripheral fit. When you see the total diameter, only concentrate on the total diameter. And similarly for the lens location and lens movement. So assess these parameters individually. So first you go on changing lenses till you get the most accurate central fit. Once the central fit is there, then you go on to the peripheral fit. So one by one, you move down the line. So uh, when, you, when you purchase a trial set of uh, rose scale contact lenses, the company has got their own recommendation, you know, what should be your first lens of choice for conducting the trial. So based on your, uh, if you see here, based on your curves, if, if the flat curve is more than 7.1 millimeter, then you go 0.2 steeper than the average. If the curve is between six to seven millimeters, then you go same as average. And if it is less than 5.9, which is a very steep cone, then you go 0.3 millimeter flatter than the average. Now these values would go on changing with new and new research. So with your trial, trial lens set, the company would give you a sheet that will recommend the, the first trial lens, which needs to be selected for a given patient. So you need not remember these values, just go through that sheet. At the time of making this presentation, the set that I had showed these values, but your final value would be determined by the fluorescein pattern. So these values are basically indicating only the first lens of choice, but the final ordered lens will be based on your fluorescein pattern. And if you're using topographer, you can go in for the average of SIM case. So topographer is a very interesting instrument and people who are into fitting RGP contact lenses or specialty contact lenses, I would strongly indicate that if you can afford to buy a corneal topographer, that's the best thing because it can help you in so many ways. It is an excellent tool for achieving a good central fit. It may not be able to predict peripheral fit, especially in miniscleral and scleral contact lenses. Uh, in RGP contact lenses, to a certain extent, it can predict. And it is, of course, no use for power calculation because power is best got by doing the over-refraction. Now, whatever fancy instrument you have, I would strongly indicate or recommend that you should conduct a trial for any specialty contact lens case and definitely for keratoconus case. Now, if you see the bottom pictures, uh, these have been taken in my clinic. So this is the simulated pattern. So based on the patient's corneal topography, uh, we virtually put a contact lens on the patient's eye and we check the fluorescein pattern. And this was the actual fit. So it is so close. It is like almost perfect. So topographer can play a good role in achieving a good contact lens fit. <clears throat> now this is true for any contact lens, allow a minute or two of settling time because initially you might feel, you know, there is too much of fluorescein in the center. But if you wait for about 60 to 90 seconds, the fluorescein will wash off and then you will understand the true fitting. 
So it is always better not to assess the fit instantly. Just let the patient wait for about 60 or 90 seconds, and then you check the fluorescein pattern. <clears throat> now we are uh, we are we are actually trying to assess the first part of fit assessment, which is the central fit. So just ignore the periphery for the moment. Ignore the diameter for the moment. Just concentrate on the central fit. So uh, we our final aim is to achieve a central fit, which is just bearing on the cornea. So it should not be a frank touch, but it should be a little bearing because these kind of fits will give you better visual outcomes. So it is said, you know, you err on the side of a steeper fit. So you go on uh, moving towards the steeper side till you get a frank steep fit like this. So we know that there is too much of fluorescein in the center, right? So this is definitely a steep fit. And then you backtrack one lens. So when you come down, when you go slightly flatter than your earlier steeper fit, then you get a very mild or a feathered touch in the center. This is what we should aim for. So the moment you see a fit like this, then this is perfect. So now your central fit is done. So you see, this is the ideal fit. You can see some touch here. Now this is, remember, this is not a frank touch because there is still some fluorescein underneath the lens. Because if there is touch, then there would be <clears throat> staining of the cornea, which we definitely don't want. And remember I said, assess the fit when the lens centers. So if you see here in the first picture, top left, uh, the lens is lagging down. When the lens lags down, there is too much of fluorescein accumulation here. And we can erroneously uh, conclude that this is a steep fit. But the moment the lens goes a little bit up, you see the fluorescein here is becoming little less. And then in the bottom left picture, this is a perfect, perfectly centered lens and you can see the feather touch and everything appears to be fine. If it goes too much superior, there is accumulation of fluorescein on the superior side. Again, you might make an error of judgment about the fit here. So make sure you assess the fluorescein pattern when the lens is centered. And as I told you initially, use the Rattan filter. So if you use the Rattan filter, you can assess the fluorescein in a much better way. <clears throat> This is basically a yellow filter, which we place in front of the microscope other than installation of fluorescein. Now, once you got that light feather touch, once you're happy with the central fit, then with that lens, you try to assess the periphery. So here now you don't pay attention to the central fit, you're only trying to assess the periphery. So the edge lift is about 0.6 to 0.8 millimeters of fluorescein band at the periphery. So this is a fluorescein band. So it should be anywhere between 0.6 to 0.8 millimeter, a little less than one millimeter. <clears throat> now, uh, this is how you can adjust the edge lift. So your standard edge lift is denoted by zero here, and you can decrease the edge lift, means you're bringing the lens edge closer to the cornea, right? So if there is too much of fluorescein at the periphery, you may want to decrease the edge lift. So you can decrease by 0.5, you can decrease by one, you can decrease by 1.3, or you can decrease any amount in between as well. And similarly, if you feel that there is very less fluorescein in the periphery and you want the edge lift to be slightly more, you want the edge to be lifted up, then you can say increase by 0.5 or increase by one or increase by 1.5, 2, 2.53 like that, you know? But uh, what David Thomas people or what Manicom people would, uh, would tell you is, 85% of the fits, 85% of the fits can fit between decrease 0.5 to increase one. These are the edge lift. So most commonly, you don't really need to go beyond this band here. 0.5 decreased to one increase. So 85% of the fits, you can satisfactorily give accurate fit within these. So, uh, as we talked about it earlier, 0 0.7, 0 0.6 to 0.8 millimeter of fluorescein band in the periphery. Now, if you see the pictures at the bottom, right? The first picture is an adequate fit. The second picture is slightly flatter edge lift and the third picture is steeper edge lift. Now, best thing, how, what you can do is just go on to their website, rowscalelens.com and you can get to see all those pictures. So you understand what is steep, what is flat, what is optimum. And the edge lift, as I've told you earlier, it can be adjusted from uh, decreased edge lift to increased edge lift. So decreased 1.3 to increased about three. Now your edge lift fitting is done. Now we move on to total diameter. Now total diameter should be such that little part of the lens should be under the upper lid. 
So if you've studied your RGP contact lenses uh, properly in your optometry school, then you would remember a term called as fitting by cop technique. So cop technique is basically pushing the lens edge under the upper lid. So the upper lid will hold the lens edge and it will glide the lens over the cornea. So any given point in time, the upper lid is holding the edge, lens, edge lift, uh, edge of the lens. And uh, this fitting is very comfortable for the patient to wear, okay? Uh, it should of course be clear of lower limbus. It should be clear of all the limbuses other than the upper wherein the edge lift is, is holding the lens. And the lens has to locate centrally. So it should not be high riding, it should not be low riding, or as far as possible, it should not be laterally decentered also. Sometimes it can be depending on the cone position, but try to get it uh, most in the center. So if you see the top left picture here, the lens is fitting in the interpapapral area. So although this fitting is fine, the patient will get good vision, but the comfort will not be as much as it should be. So if you increase the lens edge and cover this distance, if you push the upper edge under the lid, then definitely the patient will say the lens is very much comfortable. Now top right picture is an ideal fit. So little part of the lens is going under the lens, under the lid. And bottom left picture, if you see too much of lens edge is going under the lid. So you might want to reduce the diameter slightly, maybe 0.2 millimeters or 0.3 millimeters. Again, the lower light, right picture is quite less. <clears throat> lens location, as we talked about it earlier, it should be more or less centered. So if it is not centered here in these four pictures, if you see the bottom left picture, the lens is properly centered. So this is a very accurate fit. So if the lens is high riding. Now for a moment, if you don't concentrate on the slide and if you just logically think if the lens is high riding, what all can you do? You can tighten the edge lift. You know why the lens goes up? Because the upper eyelid is pulling the lens up. So you want to reduce this interaction between the lens edge and the upper lid. So how would this happen? If you just push the lens towards the cornea and release the lens from the upper lid's grip. So that way you need to tighten the lens, uh, the edge lift. And you can even reduce the diameter. If the, if the lens edge is going too much under the upper lid, you might want to reduce the contact lens diameter. You can steepen the base curve. So if you steepen the base, base curve, the edge lift also will reduce. And uh, sometimes, you know, if the lens is resting on the cornea, okay, the lens is rocking here, the edge goes up. So if that is the condition, and if you steepen the base curve, the lens settles down nicely on the cornea and gets released from the upper lid. Or you can do a combination of these three. So most often tightening of the lens edge lift or reducing of the edge lift and reducing of the diameter should solve this problem. Similarly, just the opposite if the lens is riding low, you want the lens to be picked up by the upper lid. So how would that happen? You increase the diameter of the contact lens or you increase the edge lift. So the moment the edge is lifted up, it, it gets picked up by the upper lid. So if the lens is riding low, it gets picked up by the upper lid and the lens enters very well. And again, you can do a combination of three, these three parameters. Ideal movement, we all know, just like in any RGB contact lens fitting, it should be about one to two millimeters. So sometimes you get troubled by dimple veiling, uh, and sometimes it becomes difficult for you to distinguish, for us to distinguish between dimple veiling and pooling. So <clears throat> dimple veiling is basically trapping of tiny air bubbles under the lid, under the lens. Sometimes the cone is such that you just cannot achieve a proper fit. From somewhere the air is escaping inside and the air is getting trapped under the lens. So if that is the condition, you may want to move the patient or upgrade the patient to mini scleral lenses or full scleral lenses. But these are basically air bubbles which get trapped under the lid, un under the RGP contact lens and they create depressions in the corneal epithelium. These are not frank staining, so you need not worry about it. The moment you remove the lens, these depressions will vanish within about five, 10 minutes. <clears throat> so if we can afford to flatten the base curve, if there is, uh, there is some scope of flattening of the base curve, you can flatten it or increase the edge lift, thereby allowing the air to escape out. <clears throat> Decrease the diameter or again, a combination of these, but if it just doesn't solve the problem, then you move the patient to mini scleral lenses or scleral lenses. Then we move on to the fourth parameter, which is the power. So how do you do over refraction? Whatever lens you're putting on the patient's eye, you start bracketing. You basically have a plus one and a minus one and find out whether the vision is slightly better with plus one or a minus one. If the patient says minus one, 
then you increase the minus one in the trial frame and again you do plus one minus one or you could even move to plus two minus two and once the patient says okay both are almost same then you reduce the power to plus half minus half and then finally you move to plus half plus 0.25 minus 0.25 and that way you can actually do the over refraction very fast <clears throat> or if you have auto refractometry or if you're an expert in retinoscopy then you can just do a quick flash value or you can do er over the contact lens and directly put the value and just uh, modify the over refraction to the bare minimum so what happens when you have corneal astigmatism? Because many of these patients have uh, corneal astigmatism and sometimes it is of a very high degree. So the lens fit becomes uncomfortable if it is too high. And the lens can low ride or it can locate at any random position. It can move laterally also. And I can, in this picture, if you see, this is with the rule corneal astigmatism and we've put a spherical rose key contact lens on this patient. So if you see here, there is a vertical band of cooling. There is too much of edge lift at six o'clock and at three and uh, nine o'clock, if you see here, there is bearing. So this can lead to three and nine o'clock staining and the lens fit is little unstable and the patient is not very happy with the comfort. So if you get such patients, you have the facility of ordering toric peripheral curves. So the toricity is not there in the center, but it is only there in the periphery. So you can have different periphery in the vertical and different periphery in the horizontal, okay? And these are available for all range of rose key contact lenses. And the standard value of toricity is 0.8 mm difference. So when you order a standard uh, toric peripheral curve of 0.8 mm, which means that one meridian will be steeper by 0.4 millimeters and one the other meridian, the opposite meridian will be flatter by 0.4 millimeters, okay? The uh, TPC, as it is called in short for toric peripheral curve, TPCs are available from 0.4 millimeters to 1.3 millimeters. And if the toricity is very high, if it is beyond one diopter, or if you have a uh, topographer with you, and if you see that the toricity is there in the center also, then you have the facility of ordering full back surface toric lens. So rather than ordering only toric peripheral curves, you order toricity all across the contact lens. If there is some amount of residual astigmatism, you can order the final lens based on your spherical equivalent values, or you can prescribe on top uh, spectacle correction, or you could uh, even have front toric contact lenses. I would advise if you're not well versed with fitting of RGP contact lenses, avoid this option in the initial stages of your practice. But once you get confident about fitting these lenses, then you can experiment with ordering front toric contact lenses. So any amount of residual astigmatism can be actually ground on the front part of the contact lens. So thereby the vision becomes very clear with the same contact lens. And there is no need for any over refraction either in form of glasses or sunglasses. So we could prescribe AR coated photochromatic glasses. So which acts as a protective glass and also enhances the vision further. It is easier to stick with toric peripheral curves than the full back surface toric contact lenses because these are much easier to fit and they can, they can rotate in any uh, direction and still the vision will not be affected because the toricity is only limited to the periphery, right? <clears throat> Sometimes you, you know, overall the fit is very nice, but at six o'clock the lens is slightly lifted up. If that happens, we have the facility of asymmetric corneal technology, wherein we can just tuck in the six o'clock portion of the contact lens. Now this tucking in, we can order in three values, which is ACT1, ACT2, and ACT3. Best thing is uh, you go through your fitting manual that the company kindly provides, and then you would know if this is the fluorescein pattern, then you need to order an ACT1. If this is the fluorescein pattern, you need to go with ACT2 and uh, that should solve the problem. So it's only in the bottom six o'clock part that the curvature would be changed, the rest it should be fine. So there uh, is my last slide. Uh, I basically, I was awarded as uh, the best optometrist in 2011 by Shankar Netralia. And this is my guru, Dr. S.S. Badrinath from whom I received this prestigious award. And as Aditya mentioned in the beginning of this presentation, that my clinic was voted as India's first center of excellence for fitting of irregular corneas by David Thomas Contact Lenses of UK. So that's it, we come to the last slide of the presentation. And uh, if there are any questions, 
I would I would be happy to answer them. And I was told that there is a little delay between what I'm presenting and when it is visible on YouTube. So I would be live for another one minute or so for your questions to come. Thank you so much. And once again, wishing you a very happy World Side Day. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yashwant. I think that was a wonderful uh, articulation of how contact lenses can be tried in ectatic corneas. Uh, we do have some questions from our students who are uh, watching the stream. Here. So we'll kickstart with that until we get some of the questions on the stream. Uh, so one of the questions that they've asked, and I've kind of copy pasted it in, is saying that uh, is there a way to fit an advanced keratoconus patient if you don't have access to diagnostic modalities like a corneal topographer in your clinic? Well, if you don't have corneal topographer, it's okay. You don't need corneal topographer as long as you have the trial sets with you. So just by looking at the side profile, from the side, if you look at the corneal profile, that can give you a fairly good idea what should be your first lens of choice. Now you can go wrong there, but your fluorescein pattern tells you that you're, you're wrong. So based on your first fluorescein pattern, you move on to the second floor, uh, second contact lens. And based on your second fluorescein pattern, you take the third lens. Generally about in three tries, you should get the, the most accurate fit. So corneal topographer is good to have instrument, but it is not a must, but definitely you should have trial sets with you. And another thing I would like to mention here, uh, if the reverse is true, if you don't have the trial set, but if you have corneal topographer, then corneal topographer have got fluorescein simulation softwares. So you can actually capture the corneal topography. And uh, remember in one of the slides I showed you, you can virtually put the contact lens on, on that eye and you can go on virtually modifying the fit till you achieve the most ideal fluorescein pattern. And based on that, you can directly order a contact lens. So that also works very well. But I would strongly uh, suggest that you order a trial set first, uh, sorry, a trial lens first, and then you order your final lens. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does. The second okay. question that came was saying that uh, as optometrist, at what stage uh, would you recommend that they consider referring it to a cornea specialist or an ophthalmologist? For keratoconus? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't think you need to refer this case to an ophthalmologist unless until the cornea, the, the cone is progressing. Because if the cone is progressing, then you may want the ophthalmologist to do collagen cross-linking so we can stabilize the cone there. So if you are actually prudent enough to uh, measure the corneal uh, curvatures, either using corneal topography or by using your K readings. And if you see if there is a change, let's say in one year, you see a considerable change in your K readings, then you may definitely refer this patient to an ophthalmologist so that he can do the collagen cross-linking and send the patient back to you for contact lens fitting. But if the cone is not progressing, then it's really not required. And uh, I think the last question that we have is, uh, do you have any pearls uh, when you're fitting children with keratoconic eyes? Well, I don't think you should get children uh, having keratoconus because keratoconus generally occurs at puberty. So 99 or possibly 100% of the patients who walk into your clinic would be uh, at least teenagers. So I don't think you will have, you might have irregular cornea in children and you can definitely use the same sets, especially the irregular cornea and post graft uh, sets for fitting of these corneas. But uh, the rules of fitting remain the same. So there is no change. In fact, you'll be surprised to, to see that the children are more cooperative than adults. I think that we completely agree with you. I think as we grow older, <laughs> we become a little fussier. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. So thank you so much, uh, Yashwant. It was wonderful to kickstart our series with your talk. Uh, we would continue to encourage people to post their questions on the YouTube stream and we'll make sure that... Uh, we will share it with Mr. Yashwat and get him to reply back to your questions at the earliest. Thank you so much. Period. And uh, thank you all for those watching our stream. Do subscribe to our channel. Through the day, you have 19 more lectures and two more invited talks, uh, ranging from optometry, ophthalmology, leadership to practice management. Thank you, Mr. Yashwat, again. Thank you so much.
So should I leave the meeting now? Uh, yes, sir. We ended the meeting. So thanks for your time, sir.